Quote, we have a cyclical bias to our sector weights. Our strongest conviction themes are a robust recovery in global trade and manufacturing. Barry joins us now for more. Barry, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Can you just walk me through that distinction again? Sure. Um, so this, uh, this outperformance of industrials relative to tech, um, it didn't just begin. It actually began uh, at the beginning of July um, from the redundant school of redundancy. But it, it, it really began when the second wave in the Sunbelt sector peaked. And um, there really are three significant trends that I think are going to persist through 2021 that will override um, opening versus work from home um, or tech versus, you know, growth versus value. And those three trends are, one, we had global trade and global manufacturing was depressed from mid-2018 through the end of 2019 because of the, the trade war. It's the only period since China was integrated into global supply chains where global trade growth was negative and world GDP was positive. So you already had this pent-up demand for global trade. The pandemic then obviously further exacerbated that, and now you're just going to get this really strong, robust move. And it'll be a little bit counter-trend from a longer-term secular trend, secular trend towards deglobalization, but it should be quite robust. I mean, even last night we saw the South Korean exports for the first 20 days of November uh, increase over 11 percent. So, right, exactly. So this trend, we think, is going to be really strong. And that, you know, that will help the industrial sector. We should also have a very robust recovery in CapEx for some of the same reasons, particularly if you get one Republican victory in the Georgia senatorial election and you don't roll back the corporate tax reform from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. But same thing, that yeah. was depressed. Business confidence was depressed by the trade war. And so with that snapping back in 2021, you have a really strong trend in CapEx next year as well. So, Barry, let me jump in, because this is an important growth. conversation. Sure. And I was looking at the same data overnight from South Korea. The export data into Europe, into the United States, into China, really positive, all good news. Is there a risk you confuse a monster inventory build in the back end of this year with some resilience in manufacturing and in the industrial sector? Uh, well, I, I, th I think for the first um, you know, couple of quarters, it'll be tough to differentiate whether it's just inventory rebound or whether you're going to have a more sustainable trend. I think that's a totally fair point, John. Um, but that, again, comes back to part of uh, this persistence that you've seen in industrials relative to tech. I mean, it's 10 percent since the beginning of July with tech only outperforming uh, industrials for a couple of very brief periods, you know, three or four days. Um, so it's been persisting for some time. And, and because of that twin shocks, I think it will it will last for a, a decent period of time. Now, longer run, for sure, we do have this deglobalization trend. So it's not as if I'm, I'm ready to pile back into what I've been calling the mercantilists, right? It's not, I wouldn't be overweighting sure. China, South Korea, or Germany relative to um, U.S. industrials. Not that at all. Bro, I wanted to bring up a conversation that I had last week, and I know you're eager to weigh in on. It's just how much we underappreciated the dynamism of the American economy, the resilience of it, and its ability to bounce back and bounce back quickly. We're going through a tough period right now, into the back end of the year. Had a series of downside surprises, just the drip feed of negative economic data. Might get some more in about seven minutes on the PMI. Barry, can you speak to the dynamism in the American economy and what you think is perhaps missed too often? Yeah, I'll, 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 um, one of the main concepts that I've been focused on for years now, going all the way back to 2014, is dynamism or turnover in the labor market, right? We get fascinated every month with whether we had 100,000 jobs or 200,000 jobs, but yet 25% of that labor market reallocates every quarter, right? Six million jobs are created every month. Six million people leave their jobs. So if you think about that dynamism and how much turnover there is, you can see it even in the jobless claims numbers where you look at cumulative initial claims versus the continuing claims numbers. And so that has been – that turnover, that churn, rehiring people going back to work has been what most of the mainstream economists have gotten wrong through this cycle. And we've seen small business creation, right, off the charts. Same sort of dynamic. But recently what's been fascinating is 
you know, I started to get concerned that people were falling off the regular state claims moving into the emergency program. And then I started to do some analysis of the gig workers, right, this whole expanded program to take into account independent contractors. That's been falling very sharply this fall. So it looks like those workers are going back uh, in, into the workforce. I don't know, maybe Uber, Uber drivers are becoming Uber Eats drivers, you know. But that dynamism, that turnover in the labor market still looks like it's really strong. And that's the best way for me to measure dynamism. And it, it's just been stunning how quickly the, the U.S. economy and labor market in particular is adjusted. Now, there's still damage out there for sure. And you can see a lot of it's related to non-pharmaceutical interventions, lockdowns and the like. But people have adjusted. And um, th that's why, you know, we continue to have upside surprises every month in payrolls. So that, to me, has is, is really been a, a feature of the, the recovery that um, most people have underestimated.